Welcome to Regulatory Ramblings. Our podcast today is brought to you by the University of Hong Kong's RegTech Lab, the HKU, SCF, FinTech Academy, the Asia Global Institute, and the HKU edX Professional Certificate in FinTech, with support from the University's Faculty of Law. I'm your host, Vijay Shandasani. Our topic today is a rather dark one, I'm afraid, and it's one that strikes a personal chord with me. Modern slavery, these days we call it human trafficking, um, the problem indirectly affects us all, as estimates are that currently there are 53 million people in the world that are in some form of slavery, 23 million of which are engaged in forced labor, and that implicates about 82% of the planet's supply chains. Again, we're all complicit in some way. It's a topic that I was first exposed to in early 2008 when I was editor-in-chief of Macau Business Magazine. The cover story for the April 2008 issue of that publication centered on human trafficking in the sex trade. And that was my last issue as editor. About a decade later, as a senior regulatory correspondent for Thomson Reuters, I wrote an article on the intersection between human trafficking, money laundering, and financial crime. And let's just say that what I learned, while just the tip of the iceberg, so disturbed me that I never revisited the topic again until today. I can't unsee what I've seen, and sometimes I wish I could unlearn what I've learned about how those that regard themselves as human beings can be so cruel in their impositions on others of their own species that they regard as less than or simply as chattel to be bought and sold and traded as they see fit. Sadly, from having spoken to survivors of human slavery, though they put on a brave face and try to go about their lives as best they can, I wonder if they'll ever truly be whole. Our guest today is someone far tougher and braver than myself, a, a former U.S. and U.N. diplomat. He's been a true warrior on the front lines against modern slavery and sex trafficking for over four decades. Matthew Friedman is an international human trafficking expert and the CEO of the Mekong Club, an organization of Hong Kong's leading businesses which have joined forces to help end all forms of modern slavery. He previously worked with the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, better known, and the United Nations in over 40 countries. Matt offers technical advice to numerous governments, banks, and corporations working to eliminate all forms of modern slavery, and he's the author of 15 books. In 2017, Matt won Asia's prestigious Communicator of the Year Gold Award. His postings have taken up all over the region from Nepal, Bangladesh, and to Thailand. The Mekong Club, which is an NGO, works with private sector banks, manufacturers, retailers, and the hospitality sectors to do what they need to do with the fight against human trafficking and slavery. The Mekong Club is very active in the ESG space and is well versed at identifying red flags and appropriate metrics to gauge anti-human trafficking compliance. Working with the private sector is an approach that served Matt and the Mekong Club well, as he puts it. Quote, the private sector has a sense of urgency, unlike the public sector. If a company does an audit on human trafficking, there's a problem. Within 15 minutes, they will call a meeting of all the relevant stakeholders and work to remediate it. The private sector does more than traditional NGOs because they are close to the action, end quote. And with that, Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I'm thrilled to have this uh, conversation with you. Something that's long overdue. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? And you know, what, what, what's, what's your background? You were, you were a diplomat and then this came on your plate. Well, I grew up in Connecticut, the United States. Uh, I'm part of a family that has five siblings. And actually, I'm the least likely person to be in Hong Kong. Uh, and the reason why I say that is I grew up in a family that was very insulated. Even going from Connecticut to Massachusetts required six weeks of planning from my family. And so actually, uh, a little bit of how I got here um, has to do with a car accident that took place many years ago when I was in New York City. 
I was uh, getting a PhD in psychology, and I thought I would eventually uh, get my PhD and have a, a thriving psychology business and make a bunch of money and live the good life. Uh, but I was also at that time working for the American uh, Health Foundation, and I had to go and do an activity in Brooklyn. And as I was driving across the Brooklyn Bridge in a taxi, the taxi got into a major accident. Uh, the car smashed into a number of other cars. The, the driver, who was an um, unregistered uh, um, immigrant, uh, ran away. Uh, the fire was burning in the car. Uh, I was unconscious. They pulled me out. And this resulted in me having to drop out of my university studies. And so uh, because I was recovering and required some surgery and so forth, I was kind of on the dole, not doing anything. And I had a friend who worked for the United Nations. And she said, well, well, if you're not doing anything, why don't you do a background paper for us? Uh, it's on Zambia. Well, I had no idea where Zambia was because a lot of Americans don't know much about geography. I looked it up, did the paper for her, submitted it. And then she said to me, well, I think it's time uh, for you to go to Zambia with this evaluation team. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm a freedman. We don't travel. Um, and she just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And as a result of her eventually convincing me that I needed to get on a plane and go to Zambia. Uh, I did so, and upon arriving in Africa, I was hooked. The idea of going to foreign places, basically working on topics that help to make the world a better place, getting paid for that was uh, very attractive to me. And so I never went back for my PhD and eventually ended up uh, working in Washington, D.C. for an organization that evaluated programs around the world. So for three years, I was traveling all over the world. And uh, as part of that process, I was uh, learning about uh, Africa and Asia and Latin America and addressing public health activities and all of these great, interesting things. And then eventually got to a point with uh, this particular organization that I was working with where they said, OK, well, we want to promote you to a directorship. Now, I was less than 30 years old, um, and uh, I was considered kind of the golden child doing these evaluations around the world, um, and uh, eventually uh, said, okay, well, I'll do it, but before I do that, I want to do a short stint in a foreign country, a developing country, so that I can you know, further my credentials and so forth, and then after that, I'll come back and I'll be the director. So I agreed to do this. I uh, went to Nepal thinking I would be there for eight months. But within the first two or three weeks of being in Nepal, I realized that I wasn't a very good evaluator at all. And the reason why I say that is that I just really didn't understand the context of what I was working with. I didn't understand the politics. And I was really embarrassed and, and humbled by the experience. So instead of coming back after eight months, I stayed there for eight years. And I worked uh, for the U.S. government that time. I then went from Nepal to Bangladesh. I was there for five years. Went from there to um, uh, Thailand, where I was there for three years, still with the U.S. government, and then jumped ship and joined the United Nations and did that for six years. After that, I set up the Mekong Club. And the reason why I set it up was going back to your opening statement. I really felt like the private sector was the way to go to address modern slavery, because if they have any inherent uh, vulnerability related to their supply chains, that uh, results in a situation where... Um, you know, it could name and shame them. It could have reputational risks and so forth. And as we get into this conversation, we'll understand more of why I think that way. So uh, highly unlikely individual to be going overseas. I've traveled to over 72 countries. I worked in over 40. Uh, every once in a while, something happens in life that changes the direction that you're going in. And that car accident changed it for me. It, it is true. It is true that um, sometimes life throws curveballs your way. And um those sharp and sudden vicissitudes can greatly alter the trajectory of one's path in life, not not just professionally, but but personally and you know health wise and emotionally and even spiritually. And sometimes, and sometimes it, it's it's for the best. You know, someone someone said, "Don't in those moments, don't ask what why is this happening to me. What made me want you to ask why is it happening for me?" Because I, I think you, you probably had a greater impact on the world doing what you're doing, but to end up on that path of misfortune had to take place. And I, I don't want to get into the metaphysics and sound fatalistic, but it's it's almost as though the the universe knows. You know what I'm saying? I totally agree with that. And in, in fact, I wouldn't have changed a single thing about my life 
My uh, family is German, and so we really had this sense of having to plan everything, and that changed the overall plan. And what I've come to realize is that you don't need a plan. And in fact, maybe the plan is not to have a plan. And so I've lived my life from that point on with that kind of philosophy. Certainly that's been my philosophy with no common scheme, plan, or purpose. And what, what I tell young people is, you know, if you're going to make plans, sketch them out in pencil. Yes, indeed. But, but coming back to human trafficking and slavery, I mean, this is, this is a dark topic. It's something that people find unseemly and squeamish. And no one wants to think about that happening to themselves or someone they care about. They're about, for the grace of God, go I. What made you want to go further into the mire? I mean, c clearly, the, pro the problem's not going away. It, it's, it's even after four decades, you, you, I'm sure you've noticed the problem, the problem's still there, right? That, that, um, there are a lot of unscrupulous actors out there and nation states and banks and corporations perhaps aren't doing all that they can, but we can get to that. But well, what, 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 what made you, made you want to delve into something so dark and bleak? Yeah. I mean, I think that, uh, we don't pick our causes, our causes pick us. So I didn't consciously decide one day that I have all of these options of things to consider. I could do poverty alleviation, or I could do girls' education, or public health. This particular topic just kept coming up in my life, and as a result of that, I, I just felt like I couldn't turn away. And so I guess my signature story is uh, years and years ago, uh, as a public health officer, because that's what I was doing when I initially went to Nepal, uh, I had the HIV AIDS portfolio. And we were finding girls 12, 13 years old who were HIV positive, and we couldn't understand what was going on. This is a very conservative culture. So we went to go and interview the women and the girls uh, from the shelters, and we heard pretty much the same story over and over again. It went something like this. Human trafficker would go into a village, flash a bunch of money around, and say he's looking for a wife. He'd say, I don't want an urban wife, I want a village wife. He'd find a girl 12 years old, befriend her, go to the family and say, I'd like to marry your daughter. In that part of the world, it's quite common to marry at that age. The family's thinking, wow, he's rich, he's handsome, he's going to take care of our daughter, going to take care of us. They then have a wedding ceremony. The entire community is there. After the wedding, he goes to the family and says, I'd like to take your daughter to Kathmandu, but don't worry, I'll be back in three months. But that isn't what's going to happen. Instead, he takes her to Mumbai, India, to the red light district where the brothels are. When he gets there, he puts her in a room and says, honey, stay here, I'll be right back. If she was coming in, she saw these people milling around, these men, these women dressed funny. She said, no, 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 no. I'm scared. Don't leave me. He said, it's okay. I'll be right back. He then goes to the madam to get the $500 for having sold her to the brothel. He has the gold from the wedding, which is part of the process, and he hands the wedding pictures over. He then leaves to go back to Nepal to do this again and again, maybe 40, 50 times in the year. The madam then goes into the room where the girl is and says, guess what? Your husband just sold you to me and you're going to be with 20 guys a day because I say so. You can imagine this girl shocked. No, 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 no. My husband loves me. No, oh, that's what happened. When many of these girls kind of internalize what's going on, they say, I'll kill myself before I do those shameful things. The madam then brings out the photograph of the wedding and says, is this your mom, your dad, your brother? If you hurt yourself, we'll hurt them. So she's trapped in this situation. In order to make her into a prostitute, it's quite simple. You bring in a couple of professional rapists, and over a two-day period of time, they use her 20, 30 times until she just lays back and accepts whatever happens to her. She does this for a couple of years until she's burnt out spiritually, emotionally, and physically, and then they throw her out on the street. So I was seeing the girls that somehow made it back to Nepal. And every time I heard these stories, there was just something about it in my DNA that said, wow, this, this is terrible. This has to stop. But I didn't understand the evil until I actually went to those brothels. I was invited by the Indian government to do public health checks. I had a police officer with me. Went into one of the brothels and there was an 11-year-old trafficking victim. This girl saw this foreign Caucasian guy standing there. She literally ran up, wrapped herself around me and said, save me. Save me. They're doing terrible things to me. I looked down at this child who was hysterically crying, turned to the police officer and said, well, I need to get this girl out of here. He said, we can't do that. What are you talking about? You're a cop. He said, if we try to leave, we'll both be killed. To make a long story short, we left. We came back with a lot more police, but of course that girl is gone. Now I tell the story because, you know, I had no intention of being an activist. I wasn't one of those 15-year-olds that said, when I grow up, I want to be, you know, an activist. I, I wanted that good life that I mentioned that I would have had if I had my PhD. But every once in a while in life, we're tested. 
That was my big test and I failed miserably. After that, I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep and did what a lot of activists eventually do. Surrender to the fact that now that I've been exposed to this, I can't turn my back. And 35 years later, here I am talking to you. Very poignant story. And um, um, but l- but, let, let me but just give it. you a sense of, uh, of, of what I used to do when I was traveling all over the world is I was a photographer. So in addition to doing my technical work, I would uh, venture into the slums. So when I was in Bangladesh or India or Pakistan or any other country, uh, I'd take my camera and I'd just wander around. And uh, now when I look back at it, I realize I probably took some significant risks related to this. But um, yeah, much of kind of my inspiration for doing development work in less developed countries was just having an opportunity to be with these people in these slum circumstances and to befriend some of them and to listen to their stories and to get to know them and to understand the life that they had. For me, you know, whether you're an ambassador or you're, you know, the person serving drinks at a reception, they're all the same to me. I've never had this distinction between hierarchy and so forth. And so I just like talking to people. And so uh, during the early years when I was in uh, both um, Nepal and Bangladesh, I, I really felt like I was home when it came to being in these less developed countries. Here I am in Hong Kong. Sometimes I feel like a fish out of water. I, it, it's just, it's too orderly and it works too well and it's too systematic and so forth. I prefer the chaos, chaos that goes along with being in a developing setting. But I just want to tell one other story just to kind of put into perspective how I got into this. And it, and, and it relates again to uh, sp- speaking with a victim. So years ago, I decided I was going to write a book to help address this issue. So I went to shelters to interview women and girls. And as part of this process, there was a girl named Gita. And every time I wanted to talk to her about her experience, she said, no, 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 I don't want to talk to you. But as I interviewed everyone else, she sat there and listened to everything I said. When I finished with that shelter and I was leaving, Gita comes running up and said, I changed my mind. You can have my story. And so I knew she had a profound story. I didn't know what the details were. So I was kind of excited to get this information because I thought I could use it. And so Gita sat on one side of the table, the rest of us on the other side of the table. And over a three-hour period, she just told the worst story I'd ever heard of rape and torture and disease and betrayal. Honestly, having heard hundreds of stories, this was that times 10. I didn't know what to say to her. I finally turned to Gita and I said, wow, Gita, you must be so angry at the traffickers for the horrible things they did to you. She paused and paused. And she said, no, I'm angry at you and you and you. She pointed at us. She said, where were you? Said that every single day she woke up praying for people to come and help her. Nobody came. Said she went to school till she was 12. She knew that all this brothel stuff is illegal right out in the open. Nobody was doing anything. She said she wasn't angry at the traffickers. She said they're just bad people doing what bad people do, bad things. She said she was angry at the good people, at society for allowing a 15-year-old girl to be commercially raped 7,000 times only to eventually get AIDS, and she was dying. I tell this story because Gita pretty much was calling us all out. In some of your opening statements, and when you were asking me about uh, how I got into this, uh, you mentioned the fact that uh, human trafficking hasn't really gone away. Well, there's 50 million people in modern slavery, and last year the world helped 0.2% of the victims not even a half percent. And it's been that way for the last 20 years. So one of the most reprehensible crime that you could possibly imagine has very little impact in the world. And so another motivation for me to get up every day and to do podcasts and do the work that I do is just feeling like I have to honor that girl that I wasn't able to help that time. And all of these other victims are out there that feel like they don't have a voice because nobody's really coming and helping them out. What most reminds me of the lyrics of uh, one of Leonard, the late Leonard Cohen's, one of his last songs, Darker, a million tears were shed for the help that never came. That's what Gita was trying to convey to you, that it was uh, an indictment of the international community writ large. Then, you know, it's as that cop said to you, you know, in that slum, that if we try to do something now, we'll both be killed. There is, there is a sense that most of the slavery that exists right now it's in the Middle East, it's in Africa, it's in India, but now I'm hearing most, most of the enslaved people in the world are in India. Is, is that correct? The country that has the highest proportion in number would be India, but uh, the United States has an estimated 700,000 people in what's called modern slavery. 
But let me kind of define what that means. That's when a person is tricked and deceived into a situation where somebody kind of controls them because of debts or threats to hold them in place. This could be women and girls that are forced into prostitution, boys as well, but not as many. You could see people who cross over the border into different countries who have created some type of a debt. And that debt basically uh, holds them to the person who owns the debt that allows them to basically control that person. And so most people think that human that slavery went away. The, the legal form that we know of that existed 200 years ago is gone, but what we have is a version of it for which the characteristics are very similar to what you would find in that old slavery. The person loses control of their life and their freedom. Now, the Mekong Group is an NGO, as, as I stated up front, but a great deal more can be accomplished joining hands with the private sector, and, and that, certainly that's been your approach, uh, you do more work with them than perhaps with other NGOs or state bodies, and as you mentioned, there's a greater impetus to take action to affect change in the private sector than there is in the public sector. Um, could, could you flesh that out a bit more? Could, could, could you elaborate, please? Well, I mean, I, I worked for a donor agency, USAID, for years, and, and as a result of that, I was in contact with, you know, literally hundreds of NGOs, non-government organizations, related to a variety of different sectors, health, education, human rights, et cetera. I then joined the United Nations thinking that, um, well, the United Nations is a powerful body and they would be able to affect all kinds of changes. But honestly, I spent a lot of time in five-star hotels, eating really good food, debating and discussing the issue of human rights and human trafficking. It was very esoteric. It was very theoretical. So the NGOs are the closest thing to bodies that are set aside to address this particular topic. But the problem is they don't get close enough to the action. Now, the private sector, as I mentioned, out of the 50 million people, about 27 million of them are in forced labor. And 82% or 83% of those um, um, businesses that are associated with this uh, are associated with the private sector because of supply chains or financing and so forth. So the private sector is right there, you know, in the action, dealing with organizations and so forth. And so the private sector has basically three motivations, profit, growth, and prestige. And all of these are potentially violated if there's a scandal or naming and shaming that associates a particular company with this issue of modern slavery. And so companies have to address this. And so most companies uh, uh, audit their supply chains. But up until recently, uh, let's talk about supply chains. For those of you who don't know what a supply chain is, it's kind of where the product is made. So let's say it's a running shoe. Tier one of a supply chain is where you assemble the running shoe. It's a factory. Tier two is where the zippers and the shoelaces and the rivets and the sole and the textiles come from. Tier three is where the raw materials. So the raw materials lead into the component parts and the component parts then lead into the... Uh... So most major companies around the world have been auditing tier one for a long time, but they haven't been looking at tier two or three. With legislation around the world that basically says that big companies have to know what their supply chains are related to modern slavery, they're now forced to look lower and lower into the supply chain. As a result of this situation, they're finding things. So an audit takes place and they see a violation. And as a result of that violation, they have to fix it. So within a very short period of time, if, if they find something, they'll bring their legal team together, their compliance team, their, their uh, uh, partners together to say what needs to be done to fix this. Now, in the old days, they would just terminate the contract. But the prevailing advice is this uh, at this time is you try to fix the situation. Because even though slavery is such a, an emotive word, many of these violations are actually quite simple. For example, if a person works in a factory and their passports are with the manager, that's a potential indicator of modern slavery. Why? Because the person can't leave because they don't have their documentation. Or if a person pays for their job, you know, through a recruitment agency and ends up in a particular location, uh, that's called debt bondage because the person has debt and that holds that person in place and so forth. So some of these things could be innocent, but many of them are associated with what we call modern slavery. And so the private sector, once they identify these things exist, can go ahead and address them. And we work with the private sector to make that happen. You know, I've always wondered, though, um, what we see going down in places like Dubai with the horrid tales the the construction workers, the migrant laborers. I mean, how much of that would you say is 
actual human slavery and how much of it is just mismanagement on the on the part of the middlemen and the contractors and the employers and the and the government that the government refuses to take oversight of the visa process thereby creating a vacuum letting the middlemen run amok yeah i mean i think uh, uh there's probably a combination of both of those factors but according to the international labor organization there are 11 indicators of modern slavery and many of those indicators of modern slavery in the Middle East are compromised on a regular basis. And so what you have are situations where a worker uh, enters into an agreement thinking that they're going to get paid a certain amount of money, but either they are cheated when they get there, they're forced to work excessive hours, uh, they're un working in unsafe situations, they're physically or sometimes even sexually abused uh, you know, they, they, an indebtedness is created for them. They don't have any rights. They don't have any days off. All of those things add up to a situation that would be identified as either forced labor, human trafficking, and or modern slavery. And so these indicators are very clear. The private sector, most private sector companies that are responsible would know what those indicators are, but a lot of them won't. And in the Middle East, the other interesting thing is there's very few non-government organizations that are there to uh, to police these situations. And so as a result of that, there's no uh, kind of investigation to determine these violations and to report it and so forth. That's completely absent from the, the process, which is why you see so many of these violations taking place in that part of the world. You know, a phrase that I, I, I'm increasingly hearing contemporary times is, the death of outrage, where, just as we saw with the John Bonet Ramsey case in, in the U.S. and Colorado and Boulder back in 96, it was like, where was the outrage in the community for what had happened? Again, same, same with places like Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Doha. I'm like, where is, where is the outrage? I mean, the, the, peop the denizens of these places, the, even the expats, they're, they don't want to rough the boat. They're getting their nice salaries tax free, you know. And, and I, as I said once to my cousin Rana, who lives there, he was like, "Why does it bother you?" And I'm like, "Why does?" My response, more of a retort, was to him was, "Why doesn't it bother you?" That I mean, and and, and this it, it's a little different for me compared to you, Matt. But and I, I don't mean that as a dig. But when I see people that look like me being treated that way, I'm sure you can understand the kind of visceral response that evokes. And, 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 and that, but this is just considered, you know, business as usual, that these societies could not be built without, in, in essence, slave labor. I mean, there, there's no other way to put it. And these countries are, are allies of the West. They're OECD nations. They're respected members of the international community, yet th th this is what happens in, in, in their own backyard. And I, I'm just seeing a disconnect that there's no, you, you can blacklist them for money laundering and terrorist financing, but, but not for this. And I, I'm, I'm just, how, how can you, how can you even show your face in the international realm when, when, when everyone knows what you're doing that, but how can you even be a member of the UN? I mean, it, it just, and and I, I can almost I, I can almost get what Gita is saying that that um, where where was the international community you know and 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 uh, but but I'd I'd like to come back to what you were saying about NGOs and how you know in the past you you go to five star hotels and not much would get done. My sense is that with NGOs they tend to intellectualize. The problem. They tend to make it an academic exercise. They tend to be very legalistic in their thinking. And as a, as a friend of mine once said, Bill Miker, uh, former rural Canadian mounted police inspector, that there are too many anti money laundering specialists in this world. There aren't enough money laundering specialists. And the two are not necessarily different halves of the same coin, they're not necessarily the same thing. Is, is, is that fair to say that NGOs? all too often tend to intellectualize and be overly legalistic and turn things into academic exercises or, or am I overstating the case? Um, yes and no. 
Uh, so like, for example, there are a lot of NGOs that work with, uh, victims or what are called survivors of human trafficking. They offer shelter, they offer psychosocial support, they offer health, comfort, transitional type activities and so forth. And, you know, they're, they're, they're very hands-on and they're actually helping people directly. On the legal side, the difficulty is that uh, the legal systems in many parts of the world are just fraught with corruption and bribery, and a lot of cases that get started just never make it to the end point. And as a result of that, you spend a lot of time, effort, and money in order to move something forward, and you don't get to the end point. On the prevention side, I kind of feel like, um, you know, um, the NGO world uh, makes an effort to raise awareness, but they're trying to get the general public in the world to understand and care about this uh, and spending perhaps less time trying to help people to understand what the vulnerability is for them to take some type of a job overseas and so forth. And as a result of that, a lot of people end up in these situations. The advantage the private sector has is that if a particular factory has people who are being supported by funding that comes from a branded company, then that branded company has control over, you know, being able to go in, uh, you know, ask questions, do audits, uh, do oversight of that particular location. As a result of that, they have access. And as I say, because of the potential reputation of risk associated with anything associated with, um, you know, modern slavery or forced labor, they have to address these things and they have to do it immediately. So, for example, there was, I'm not going to mention the company, but there was a large um, uh, fast fashion brand in um, the UK that was accused of modern slavery. As it turned out, it wasn't even modern slavery. It was uh, exploitative uh, payments to workers and so forth. But the reaction from the public was so visceral that they lost about two billion sterling pounds worth of market share as a result of that process. So the private sector recognizes the potential um, devastating impact that can happen as a result of not addressing this. And so uh, as I go back to the days when I was hanging out with my NGO friends or working with the United Nations or governments and so forth, we would have plans to develop a plan for a plan in the future. Everything was future and there wasn't this sense of urgency. About 25,000 people enter modern slavery every day. Where's the sense of urgency? Where's the sense of us feeling like as a world, we have to step up and do anything and everything we can to address this. We don't have time to think about work plan six months from now. And so I joined uh, the working with the private sector because I wanted to work with individuals and organizations that felt this sense of urgency. And whether or not they do it out of benevolence or whether they do it just to protect themselves, it doesn't make any difference to me. I just want to make sure that if people are in situations that are exploited, we have access to remedies to be able to address that, that we can do so. And by doing that, then we uh, contribute to making the world a better place. I agree. And, and, and sometimes it may take a superpower acting unilaterally to do the right thing. And... You know, I remember having this discussion once with, with Steve Vickers, and he said to me, but you know what, Jay, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, the countries that make the rules, break the rules, and enforce them, also happen to be the biggest proliferators of uh, weapons in this world, their armies aren't necessarily meant to make the world a better place, he said. He said if there was greater cooperation between them, you'd see a greater stemming of the flow of human trafficking. But he said you've got the... U.S. and the U.K., that's one block on the U.N. Security Council. You've got the Russo-Chinese block. The French are ostensibly with the West, but oftentimes they're doing their own thing. And again, he said their, their militaries, their forces, are not there to necessarily make the world a better place. <laughs> they're there to keep each other in check. If people are playing power politics, the, then yeah, I, I can see how pirates and slave lords and warlords are going to you know, be on the margins doing their own thing and, and not not uh, getting too much scrutiny. And uh, I mean, I, I guess that's, you know, sad commentary on the, on the world we live in. I mean, I've spoken to survivors of human slavery. You've spoken to a good deal more than I have. They put on a brave face and they try to go about their lives as best they can. But again, I wonder if they'll ever truly be whole. I mean, what would, what, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, I've seen the whole spectrum of victims. Um, you know, I've seen the type of victims that they are, as you say, so devastated from the experience that they can they can hardly wake up every day. Um, there's a lot of 
suicidal thoughts associated with PS, uh, you know, uh, pain and suffering associated with the memories and so forth. But I also had another situation. I'll tell you an interesting story. I, I was uh, associated with a particular raid and rescue that took place in Bangkok, and it was some Europeans that were trafficked. And um, as we were finishing the interview of one of the uh, trafficking victims, she said, well, I'd like to go home. You know, I, 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 I've been in this situation for a couple of years. And I haven't seen my family. I got to go out and find a job and so forth. And I, I couldn't understand how it is that she was just so kind of together, you know, for having uh, been in this situation. Yeah, so so eager to get back to some semblance of normalcy and, and, and to live live her life and not waste. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's amazing. You'd think they'd still be in trauma. Yeah, but this particular woman had her her life before being trafficked was even worse. She was being abused by her father and various other things. And so, you know, there's this relative sense of, of uh, uh, you know, the uh, exploitation that people uh, experience in their life. Whereas, you know, having your father abuse you and then basically going into sex trafficking is, is, is not a big jump. And so in her case, she just said, I no longer have my dad in my life. I, uh, I'm out of this situation. I want to move on. And so I was in New York City the next day. I, I went to a, uh, a, a, a drugstore to get some um, um, supplies and so forth. And I'm standing in line and there's two other people in front of me. And another woman kind of goes in front of somebody else. And all of a sudden there was this shouting match and this, you know, it became an international issue. The manager was called in and they were talking about bringing the police and so forth. There was such fragility in terms of, you know, people's sensibilities about what justice was and so forth. So I'm sitting there thinking about that young woman who wanted to just get on with her life with all the horrible things that happened and how, how kind of, uh, unprepared for life, some people are in the West when it comes to just simple things that just don't mean anything. It would have been the difference of one minute. And the reason why I say that is that part of the reason why people don't look at this particular issue is because it is so dark. It is so emotional. You you talked about it yourself when you said that it was really hard for you to go back to this. Once you've been exposed to it, you don't want to see it. And I think that's part of the biggest problem that we face is that I can't have conversations with people because the moment I mention it, they say, well, oh, I want to talk about that. That's just too, you know, I'm having a pretty good day today. I don't want to talk about that dark thing. Well, if nobody's opening their eyes, if nobody's feeling their pain, then we, we have this situation where less than 1% of the people are being helped. And, you know, this is a problem. We have to, as a world, accept the fact that we have these problems and that we as human beings have to be part of the solution. Can't just be the United Nations and the governments and the NGOs. We as human beings have to also take a stand and make decisions for ourselves. And even raising awareness and talking to your friends and posting on LinkedIn on this topic or donating or volunteering, all those things add up. Speaking of the UN, in light of the statistic you cited that I think, what, 0.3 percent of the victims are freed or recovered. I mean, and you know a lot about the UN anti-trafficking program. Is is it fair to say it's failed? Then, if that if that's the efficacy rate, then cl clearly something's lacking. This is one of twenty five different priorities for the uh, United Nations, for which is probably lower on the list. I, I don't want to say anyone's failed. Uh, organizations like the United Nations do things. Some of the things that they do are good, and I'll say the same about the NGOs. Lots of NGOs out there, they do things. The problem is the resourcing. The profits generated from modern slavery are estimated to be two hundred thirty six billion u s dollars a year. The estimated amount of money that's used to address this issue is less than four hundred million which is 0.13% of the profits generated. You know, we're not even in the game. Uh, now, I say that because I'll just use the U.S. government. The U.S. government spends about uh, $30 billion a year on addressing HIV AIDS around the world. That's a, a noble cause, and it should be addressed. I think a drug trafficking in, uh, you know, uh, budget is around 35 or $40 billion. U.S. government, which is the major donor in addressing human trafficking, it's somewhere around 170 million out of that uh, 400 million. So if you don't have the resources to be able to, you know, uh, engage in setting up programs that are really going to do prevention or prosecution or protection of these victims, you're, you're going to have less than 1% of the victims being helped. Now, part of it is that, like, had this issue come to the forefront earlier, like HIV AIDS in drug trafficking and so forth, perhaps the, the budgets would be higher. But because of, you know, the Ukraine war, the Israeli situation, you know, COVID, all kinds of other distractions, 
the money and the resources are just not there. And as a result of that, that's why we're in this situation. Broadly speaking, then, if, if you had to distill it down to a few things, what, what does the um, private sector need to do in the fight against slavery and human trafficking? I think the first thing they need to do is to understand the issue. Now, I do about 150 presentations a year. Uh, I did a road trip across the United States, uh, 70 consecutive days of presentations, went from Vancouver down the West Coast over to Texas, up to Chicago, down to uh, the Florida area, and then up to New York. And, you know, we did about 125 presentations. And I got up in front of all kinds of audiences, and very few people knew what human trafficking was, modern slavery. And as you indicated, most people think it's something that happens over there you know, unless developed in countries. I had no idea that in the United States and Canada, you have the same issue. So if you don't know about an issue, you're not going to care. If you don't care, you're not going to do anything. So general awareness is extremely important. But for private sector companies, there's other things they need to do. They need to, for example, ensure that their C-suite and the directors understand the potential vulnerability of this topic to their particular business. They have to have policies and procedures in place to address what their views are on this being a zero tolerance type situation, both internal and external, and then within their supply chains. There has to be a focal team or, or person that is uh, addressing this issue. There should be training within the organization to help those who have a potential nexus with this to know what they need to do. There should be risk assessments to identify within their business what they need to um, kind of prioritize uh, related to procurement or, you know, which organizations and which countries they work in. They need to have auditing that goes beyond just looking at the papers and the documentation where it actually uh, talks to the workers themselves to get a general sense of what their conditions are. There needs to be grievance mechanisms and supply chains that allow workers to describe situations that they experience. And lastly, there has to be some type of remediation. If the private sector finds something, they need to know what to do and how to do it in order to address these issues. Now, you know, when you talk about the different sectors, it's pretty clear why manufacturers and retailers would be concerned about this because products are made and there could be sweatshops. But the banking industry, it's because of the potential for money laundering. And it's the potential for finding themselves in a situation where supporting an activity that, for example, could contribute to modern slavery. So in uh, Australia, for example, there was a bank that was fined 1.3 billion Australian dollars because they supported an activity that allowed for online sexual exploitation of children to take place. And as a result of that, they, they got this big fine. Now, the fine was pretty big, but what was even worse is here you have a, a bank that had a 100-year reputation of being the good guys and helping the, the communities and so forth, having their name associated with modern slavery. You can imagine the devastating impact. The hospitality sector also has to be concerned because they have construction of the hotels. They buy products that could be tainted by modern slavery, seafood, for example. They bring migrants in sometimes, and they could have fraudulent uh, contracts. And lastly, sex trafficking. In the United States, uh, motels are being sued if a sex trafficking victim is uh, rescued. And they're basically saying, well, the motel allowed this to happen. And these lawsuits are moving forward. And what this is creating for the hospitality sector is a vulnerability because the insurance companies don't want to insure them anymore because they're the ones that pick up this kind of a bill. So there are these inherent vulnerabilities that the private sector has that they have to address because if they don't, they can get themselves into trouble. And that's the motivation for them to act in, in a very urgent way. Not everyone, but pe certainly m many people in the developed world, first world, the OECD nations, they aren't mentally equipped to to deal with with this, and 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 the tragedy is that they are the citizens of some of the most there's some of the most empowered people in the world, the most educated, the greatest access to resources, the most inf informationally connected and tech savvy. That you know they can reach out to their politicians, and it it'll probably have more of an impact than someone in the developing country, you know, some of the most powerful countries on earth. And yet they, they don't, they, they don't want to take action. I mean, that, that, that's, I, I pondered that many, many a night, shall we say. But let me respond to that, AJ, I, because I, I think it's a really important point. And that is, I'm going back to the point that I made about, um, we don't pick our causes, our causes pick us. 
So um, when I was still working for the United Nations, I would fly up to Hong Kong to talk to the captains of industry because we knew there was this nexus with the private sector of modern slavery, but we didn't know what the private sector knew. So because I was a UN official, these um, leaders would accept a opportunity to talk to a United Nations person, but usually they set it up months before it happened. In one particular case, I um, went into an office and I was waiting to meet this uh, CEO and and I could hear him in the background saying, oh, shoot, I, I forgot about that UN thing. Why did I take that? Oh, I don't really have time for that. Oh, I haven't come in. I'll, I'll talk to him for 15 minutes. So I walk into the room, we sit down on the couch and then, you know, he's on his Blackberry because that's what was happening still back then. And he's kind of typing away. He says, listen, I, I, I only have a few minutes. I, I really don't have time for this. Uh, I'll give you 15 minutes. And then after that, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave. I'm really busy today. So I started talking about cases. I, I gave a couple of sex trafficking examples and uh, fishing industry and so forth. And interestingly, he started looking up at me. Within another 15 minutes, uh, the Blackberry was on the couch and he was, he was leaning forward. 90 minutes later, we're still having this conversation. And by that point, he was saying, oh, well, what about this? Or what about this? And how, how, did, how, did you, how did you hook him? What was the bait? How did you manage to reel him in? Because there's something about this issue that's in his DNA. This is his issue. So when I do a presentation to 100 people, three people will come up to me and say, I don't know what it is about human trafficking, but whenever I hear this, I feel like I, I get angry inside. I feel like I have to do something. The cause reaches them. He was one of those people. And so immediately after that, he, you know, said, oh, my gosh, you know, what can I do? You know, is there anything our company can get involved in? And he basically became one of our ambassadors. And he just became a do-gooder junkie because there's a lot of people out there who have good jobs and they make good money and so forth, but they're not giving anything back. There's an imbalance in life. So they're taking, 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 but not giving anything back. When he took it upon himself to start, you know, making connections and, uh, and volunteering, doing other things, he had that balance. And all of a sudden, he just found that fulfillment in life that was missing. I think that there's a cause for everybody. For me, it's human trafficking. I can't turn away from that. I'm not interested in the other causes. I care about them, but they're not my cause. My sister doesn't care about human beings. It's all about animals. And that's the only thing that she's ever going to work on. She runs an animal orphanage. My brother, he doesn't care about human beings or animals. He cares about the environment. If we as human beings can figure out what our cause is and address it and then get the general public to be given the tools and the means and the understanding of what they can do as individuals, then we would be talking about changing the game, not only for human trafficking, for just about everything. And what I'm saying here is heroic. When people step up and get involved in things, they should be kind of lauded for the heroic activities they're doing. We don't give enough pat on the back for volunteers or people who are interested. And that incentive and that uh, encouragement is very much needed as part of the process of getting people to step up and be a part of the solution. So I wrote a book called Be the Hero, Be the Change. And that particular book was all about helping people to find their cause and then to identify what needs to be done for them to you know, be a part of the solution. Your, your, point, your point about giving back really resonates with me. And I think for many of us, that, that light bulb doesn't go off until much later on in life. Certainly that was the case with me. Uh, some people, they have it, they have those values inculcated into them at an early age because the families they grew up in that, that you do have some sense of noblesse oblige, if, especially if you're coming from a very privileged background, but, but even, even if you're middle class, even if you're working class, that you you do have to give back because it's that it's that quote from kevin klein in, in, in one of my favorite movies um they're over two decades old now but uh the start of the emperor's club he says to his students they're looking up someone named shitruk nahunte and in, in um in their books and they can't find anything about the guy and as he says to them great ambition and conquest without contribution is without significance. And that that's the question he poses to them. Well, what will your contribution be? How will history remember you? So, yeah, I, I think for, for, for all of us, part of it is a legacy. For But but also, if you're a person of conscience, you, you can't really look away. If, if, it's, if the situation's that bad and the cause resonates with you, you can't really look away. And, yeah, certainly that seems to have been the case with you, which 
brings me to my next question, which is given all your years in the field, what's changed about human trafficking and to what extent has it remained the same? Um, I would have to say that there is more general awareness about kind of the fact that this exists. We see it in companies, we see it in schools, we see it in uh, communities and so forth. Uh, so that change is there, but that's not enough. Um, and this is where it's basically stayed the same. We have been at less than 1% uh, of addressing the issues of uh, these victims for much of the 35 years that I've been working on this. And, um, you know, if I was a pessimist, I would have burnt out a long time ago because, you know, when you stop and look at the fact that we're having for virtually no impact at all, um, you, it would just shut you down. And in fact, there have been times in my life that that's happened. Uh, and so in order to, um, kind of maintain momentum, recognizing that we're not helping a, a, a large proportion of people, we, we, as the, as part of the counter trafficking world, uh, use the starfish parable to, to encourage ourselves. Do you know what that is? No, I, I've never heard of it. You, you'll probably recognize it when I say it. So there's a father and son walking down a beach. It's about 10 kilometers long. And as the father's walking, he sees these beach starfish. So he picks it up, chucks it in the water, sees another one, picks it up, chucks it in the water, does this continuously for about a kilometer. The son looks at the dad and said, dad, what are you doing? You know, this beach is, you know, 10 kilometers long. You can't possibly save all these uh, starfish. What difference does it make? Well, the dad looks to the sun and says, well, to the starfish that makes it into the water, it makes all the difference in the world. You know, the point is that we as kind of trafficking responders have to take, you know, each of these excesses that we have of helping people or preventing things from happening or getting people back in their life as a big victory, because that's really what encouraged us to continue doing this. But, you know, as a, as a responder and addressing human trafficking for so many decades, uh, I still feel like there's this possibility that for whatever reason, this particular issue will just someday go viral and people will care about it. And I, and I say that because we see examples, for example, you know, about, uh, seven or eight years ago in India, there was a sensational rape case where a young 24 year old medical, um, student was, uh, raped on a bus and killed. And as a result of that, the entire country just got up in arms and women came together and did marches and they, they, they put pressure on police stations and they changed laws and everything else. I think the potential for that catalytic, you know, uh, monumental change exists. I, I don't know what the ingredient is to make this go viral, but I'm just hoping someday that happens. And so there's this awakening within the world that what we're dealing with is so profound and so horrific and so relevant to, you know, our values that it just has to stop. Um, and, and I have to believe that because if I didn't, I just couldn't go on doing what I do. Delhi is particularly bad because you've got in India, not that strong of a central government. I mean, certainly outside of major urban hubs, uh, the writ of the central government isn't as strong. And, and from what people in law enforcement have told me in Delhi, that when most of your time, it's the national capital. So you're dealing with terrorism threats, guarding politicians, foreign dignitaries, all the rest of it. Crime is allowed to flourish in that environment. And uh, yeah, it's a par partly it's a matter of resources, partly it's a matter of will. And I would tell you any day as a woman, you, if you're out and about late at night, you're, you're safer in the streets of, Mumbai or, or, or Chennai or, you know, Calcutta, Bangalore, any day c compared to New Delhi, the nation's capital. And that's, it's a pretty sad, sad indictment, but yeah, that, that, uh, that's how it is. W what that catalyst of change will be. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure you've heard of the recent rape case of a, of a female doctor in hospital. And, and, and so. I, I don't want to pick on India too too harshly, but perceptions do become reality, and that that can you know that 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 can tarnish your nation's image, and uh, you know then there's the safety issue for your fem your female citizens, and and uh, how how empowered will they be? How how inclined will they be to go out and 
live life to the fullest and contribute to society if they don't feel safe. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, that, that's just a fundamental uh, aspect of our lives, safety uh, and trust in um, the environment that you're uh, kind of living in and working in and so forth is, is an essential component of what people do and don't do. Uh, you know, I live in Hong Kong. The crime rate is extremely low here. And as a result of that, at any given time, three and four in the morning, if I wanted to go out, I don't think uh, I'd be concerned about anything. If you don't have that type of a sense of trust in the place that you're living, then and it, it influences the decisions you make and the freedoms that you have living in a particular culture. And as you say, it's not just India, it's all over the world. I mean, Washington, D.C. is the capital of the United States, but there's a lot of crime there as well. Um, you know, a lot of places you wouldn't want to go late at night in, in that particular city. It's just the way it is. Well, I used to live in Chicago, and I'm told that um, I, when I was there from 04 to 06, a very different world. Even the financial district, the West Loop, even that's not safe anymore. I mean, it, 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 um, you know, ch I guess, ch sign of the times, I, I guess, um, uh, as I prepped for our chat, uh, and, and the, some of the reading that I did, it became clear to me that something that was interesting about the evolution of human trafficking that struck me was how it's gone from manual labor to more of the scam farm stuff and, um, and I guess what I'm wondering is what, what does that mean then for, for the manual stuff? Okay. So let me talk a little bit about kind of what you're talking about in terms of the, the... And, and especially when, when you've enslaved educated people and you, you put them to work, maybe not in doing physical stuff, but stuff that's criminal and morally objectionable, but th they have no choice. And so they're compelled to commit crimes for for their slavers so in cambodia um uh during covid you had these uh both online and physical casinos that were in place there's a lot of opportunity for criminal activity to take place in that particular location and then when covid hit all of a sudden people weren't coming so you had all this infrastructure but nothing was being done with it and so criminals came to realize that well We'll just see if we can just scam people online. And every 10th person that they asked for money, they were able to trick them into, into getting pretty good money for doing nothing really at all. So they said, okay, well, let's see if we can hire a bunch of Asian people and, uh, and then we can go and get even more people scammed. And when they approached Asian people, the Asians said, well, we don't really feel comfortable. We want to do this. And so they said, okay, well, we'll get them to these locations and then we'll just convince them that this is what they want to do. Uh, and so they started to put in false advertisements about jobs and casinos, and you could go and make 5,000 US dollars a month and have a great life and so forth. So a couple of hundred thousand young, educated Asians ended up in Cambodia and Myanmar and eventually in Laos in these scam centers. So they arrived, they're brought to these centers. They're like uh, these big... Uh, compounds that have multi-story buildings that have, you know, nine foot walls and barbed wire and closed circuit television and security people. And when you're there, you have to deliver. If you don't deliver at the end of your 14 hour shift, you get tasered, you get beaten, tortured, terrible things happen to you. And so there's two parts of this. So you have human trafficking into these scam centers, which are victims that didn't know what they were getting into, and then they're forced to stay there. So that's why it's human trafficking. But at the same time, they're scamming people out of their life savings. And they call it pig butchering uh, is because what this particular scamming scheme does is, you know, let's say it's a young woman pretending to be a 25-year-old Thai woman. She befriends a 55-year-old uh, divorced person from the West. You know, she pretends to have this uh, loving relationship with them. This goes on for about a month. And then she introduces crypto. She says, I just made a bunch of money. Why don't you try it out? So she encourages the guy to put in 5,000 US. He does, and then it doubles the next day on this fraudulent website. And then she says, take the money out. So you have it in physically in your hands. So he does that. A couple of weeks later, she says, put the 10,000 in. It doubles, take that out, 20,000. After another week, she says, oh, this great deal coming. If you put a million dollars in, you get $5 million back. So this is all leading up to developing trust and you know, ensuring that like, if the money goes in, it can come out. And so she convinces the person to put their life savings into this situation. And then once the person does that, um, then it gets shut off and then, you know, the deal is, is, uh, is lost and the person loses everything. It's called pig butchering because you're fattening the pig, which is the victim until you slaughter them. 
similar to getting all of their money and then you slaughter them. So this process uh, started here in Southeast Asia, but it's expanding into Bangladesh, India, Nepal. We're seeing it in Dubai, Africa, Latin America. So these, uh, these syndicates are basically uh, using individuals who are educated, who you know, have oftentimes degrees, and they're basically having them scam people around the world. The motivation is to avoid being beaten and tasered every day. In some cases, they'll even take the person out and back, torture them to death, videotape it, and then sell those videotapes. It's called harm core. So there's this whole criminal activities. According to Interpol, the profits generated from this are about $3 trillion dollars. U.S. I was shocked when I heard that figure, and I keep going back and saying to myself, this can't be true, but this is what Interpol is using in their documentation. So that's a new form of human trafficking. Actually, it hasn't, hasn't taken away from the manual work. The manual work is just as robust as it was before, same number of people. It's just an additive thing. So instead of, you know, uh, migrants from less developed countries finding themselves exploited in different parts of the world, you've added a new cadre of people which are educated uh, people from Asia and now uh, Africans and South Asians and other parts of the world are being, you know, uh, tricked into these scam centers. And so it's just a new form of human trafficking. What do you see as the link between modern slavery and the financial sector? Is there a link or is it, is there as much of a link as there is between modern slavery and the corporate world? or the business community more, more generally, that it's connected to everything, therefore we shouldn't just single out the financial sector. But, or is there, is, there, is there a connection between modern slavery and the financial world that, 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 that warrants scrutiny? Well, as I said, the profits generated from modern slavery are $236 billion a year. If any of that dirty money gets into a legitimate bank, it's money laundering. So the banks have to be concerned about this. And so, as I mentioned, there was that bank in uh, Australia, 1.3 billion Australian dollars lost as a result of, uh, of something associated with human trafficking that was happened online. We've seen other banks that have been fined, not nearly as much, but again, it's the combination of the fines in the reputational risk that poses a problem. So let me give you an example of a, a typology of uh, a particular criminal activity that banks uh, found out about and then addressed. And so banks are always looking at their clientele to see whether or not there's any nefarious activities that are taking place, corruption, fraud, you know, uh, anything else associated with that. Well, there was an accountant in the United States that was looking into a nail salon a chain that was across the East Coast of the United States, happened to be run by uh, Vietnamese people. And so what they determined was that the hours were from nine o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock at night, but they were finding transactions that took place at two, three, four o'clock in the morning, all around 200 US dollars. So when they did a deep dive into this business, they came to realize that there was a sex trafficking ring being run in the same business location, but after hours. So the, the typology or the red flag indicators that the banks would use would be a particular type of business with uh, expenditures after hours around a particular amount of money. Once you get those indicators, red flags, what they call them, and you run it against your big data, you might find other examples of um, nefarious activities that are taking place within your clientele. And then as a bank, because you're trying to protect your business, you can, uh, you know, uh, 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 do a suspicious transaction report that goes off to the regulators, or you could uh, debank them or do various other things and so forth. And so the banking community uh, community has to be concerned about this because there's transparency legislation in the UK, Australia, Germany, Canada, the United States that says if you're a big institution, you have to describe what you're doing to address modern slavery. And the big banks have to do that as well. And so they are now spending a fair amount of time and effort to really do a deep dive to figure out what they need to do in order to identify these typologies. Uh, the Macon Club, the organization that I run, just came up with an updated version of these typologies. For those of you who don't know what a typology is, it's basically describing criminal activity and breaking it down into component parts and then looking at transactions associated with that, allowing for risk assessment people and compliance people within the banks to be able to figure out if there is a, uh, a criminal activity taking place. And then they will look into this and then determine what to do if they find some criminal activity. That protects the bank. It's fair to say then that there is an intersection between 
money laundering and financial crime and human trafficking, right? I mean, well, I'll take it one step further. Um, like, for example, in uh, Singapore recently, there was a sensational case where a billion U.S. dollars worth of luxury goods and properties and cars and Gucci bags and various other things were were being used to launder money that came out of these scam centers in um, uh, Cambodia. And uh, later they found out it wasn't a billion. It was actually three billion. So if you're generating billions of dollars uh, through these scam centers, you have to uh, find a way of translating that from crypto to fiat money. So there's all kinds of money laundering schemes that are out there that are being run uh, that have to be identified. And so you have the banking world that's doing everything they can to identify what these scams and these approaches and this money laundering, the systems and procedures are, uh, because again, they do this to protect their banks. They do this to protect their reputation and their prestige and everything else. And so uh, the banks are actively and aggressively doing everything they can to to identify and uncover these uh, these scenarios so that they can stop it and have it not be associated with their business. In, in terms of what banking and financial institutions can do to protect themselves from becoming unwitting participants in human trafficking and the sex trade, I mean, what what can they do? What do they need to know? Other, I mean, other than just spending more money on compliance and risk management, what re realistically, what can they do that they aren't already doing? Because I'm guessing they're probably cognizant of many of these risks. Well, uh, I'm going to tell a story, um, and, and it may or may not answer your question, but but I, I think it has relevance to this. Uh, so I was at a banking conference in Washington, D.C., and at the end of it, this guy comes up to me and says, I'd like to tell you a story. And that happens when you do public speaking. And so I said, go ahead, tell me your story. And he said, well, uh, my wife and my teenage daughter and I were going from one part of the United States to the other part. And, you know, as we were traveling, uh, we got to the halfway point, pulled into a motel. I got my wife and daughter settled. I was going out for food and I saw this 14 year old girl being dragged into a hotel room. And I knew it had something to do with prostitution. And because I had a teenage daughter, I was really concerned about it. So I went to the manager and I said, I saw this. I think there's some legal activity taking place. So we went back to his room and he's kind of peeking out the curtains to see if anything would happen. And sure enough, 15 minutes later, police car comes. 15 minutes later after that, guy's being taken out in handcuffs. And the girl then is put into an unmarked, non-police car, presumably to a shelter. So he said, I just needed to tell somebody about this. I was so proud of that situation. I, you know, I, I felt so good about this. This is a milestone in my life. So I looked at the guy and I said, well, what do you do? And he said, I'm a banker. And I said, yeah, you're in a banking conference. I get that. What do you do? He says, I'm a compliance person. I look at, you know, f uh, the, you know, our clientele. I determine if there's any nefarious activities in the illegal activities taking place. I ask him if, if he ever ran human trafficking cases. He says, yeah, every once in a while we, we see something that's suspicious. And by law, we have to uh, take this information and put it into what's called a suspicious transaction report and submit it to the regulators. And I said, have you done that more than once? He said, yeah, dozens of times. So I looked at this guy and I said, dude, don't you realize that you've been doing this work all along? You've been basically addressing this issue. You don't see the same cold face of what might happen you know, if they kick in doors in order to address this, but what you're doing is heroic. You're protecting your organization, your bank, but at the same time, you're making the world a better place. And so it took him a few minutes to kind of get his head around the fact that I was saying that his job was important. And all of a sudden he said, yeah, you're right. What we are doing, it's really important. It's relevant. It's making the world a better place. So a couple of months later, I'm in Singapore on stage. I do this big presentation to 650 bankers and I tell that story and I look at the audience and I realize, and I said to them, you guys are compliance people. You're doing all these things to ensure that there's no nefarious activities, no, no illegal activities. And by you doing that, you protect your bank, but at the same time, you're doing heroic things. The world's a better place. I must've had about 30 people come up to me afterwards and basically say, wow, nobody says that to us. Nobody pats us on the back. Nobody says that what we do is relevant and important and so forth, but you're right. So what I've seen within the banking world is there's a lot of people who are just, you know, going through doing their job, thinking that it's just a normal, boring thing that they have to go about without being inspired, without helping them to understand that they can address sex trafficking. They can address forced labor. They can address, you know, the scam type situation. But in order to do that, they have to recognize that the work that they're doing is relevant and important. And so this 
this message is extremely important because we see this not only in the banking world, but in the um, in the uh, manufacturing world where you have uh, risk people and compliance people that are doing audits and then they fix things and make things better. The private sector has been involved in addressing modern slavery for a long time. They never get any credit for it because they never talk about it. But because they're closer to the action, because they're addressing these things that they come up, they're really making a difference. And so the bank does have a role to play and it can address sex trafficking and any of these other things. They just have to kind of recognize the fact that in order to do that, they have to get deeper into the topic. They have to understand what the vulnerabilities are. They have to then dissect that and dissect it and dissect it till they get to a fine point of identifying what these red flag indicators are and then get on with it. And then, you know, basically do what they can to, uh, to stop these things from happening by reporting them and so forth. I think you took, I mean, you should be taking the wise approach in the, uh, I'm sure you've heard the saying, you, you can attract more, more flies with honey than, than with vinegar. And certainly some of the least praised people at many financial institutions are the compliance people. So yeah, hats, hats off to you for recognizing what they do. But if I had to play devil's advocate, I'm looking at a lot of these financial institutions, and, and by this point, they've all been fined. They've all, all the major ones have been fined. They've all had their reputations maligned to some degree. And it seems to me that reputationally, a lot of them aren't too concerned. Financially, fines are just another cost of doing business. Now, obviously, reputational loss, I would say, from involvement, complicity in human trafficking is probably far greater than if you had a terrorist financing, terrorist transaction slip through the nets and an Iran sanction slip through the nets. You know, being involved in human trafficking, it, it, it just, it looks a lot worse. And so in that, in that regard, it's, it, it's more damaging. But, but it seems to me that, again, many of them, they're quite content paying the fine. They're quite content hiring spin doctor law firms and PR firms to, you know, to cover it up, certainly in the Middle East. You know, they will, they'll spend more to cover up the problem than they will to address it. Am I being too cynical here? Um, okay. Um, I often, when I do my presentation, start with what I would describe as emotional stories. And there's always people within the banking audiences that are moved by those stories. And again, it comes down to the, we don't uh, pick our causes, our causes pick us. If you can reach people on an emotional level and then say to them, here are the means and the tools to be able to address it, there's a lot of people who want to be a part of that solution. And again, it comes back to that point of, there's a lot of people who have good lives and good jobs and they make good money and they don't want to change that, but they feel empty inside. They feel like there's a lack of purpose that they're not really contributing to making the world a better place. If we are able to engage these individuals within their institutions, then it makes a difference. And, so, appeal, and appeal to the humanity. Exactly. But so, so when I, I do all of these presentations, because I want to get in front of a hundred people and I want to find those five people who uh, for whatever reason, are going to self-identify with this particular topic. And then those are the people that become my ambassadors. Those are my, and sometimes it's, it's a C-suite, sometimes it's director level, sometimes it's manager, sometimes it's a secretary in an office. It doesn't matter to me. Those people are self-motivated. They want to address something. They want to get involved. And I use them to basically infect their company with a sense of good and righteousness and a desire to get involved. And so what we're doing is mining those people and trying to find out who they are and then to empower them and engage them and educate them and encourage them to be the change makers within the private sector. That's really an important part of the process of what we do. In, in, in the time we've got left, um, I, I just wanted to ask, I mean, for, for, for those that feel moved by, by what you've said, um, how, how can they, how can they join the fight? How, how, What's the best way to contact you and and um, and the Macon Club? Uh, how, how can they get in touch with you to see if they want to volunteer or, or you know perhaps work with some of such organizations? Are you, are you open to being contacted? And if so, what's the best way to reach you? Well, I would with this podcast list my um, email address if you could do that. Um, sure. 
You know, the Mekong Club is an association. Uh, we, we have a membership and, you know, as part of membership, we provide training and consultation and remediation and we identify a strategy for an organization. And what we do is to help to immunize a company to ensure that there are no vulnerabilities associated with their business. And, you know, uh, interestingly, a lot of companies come from the perspective of, I want to do something to protect so that there's not an issue, but eventually they cross over a line into saying, wow, by us doing this, uh, we are actually, uh, doing good things. And then they feel good about it. Uh, for example, I was uh, sent to Sri Lanka to do some training with some banks. And, and when I got there, the, uh, the, um, banking frontline people didn't know much about the issue and said it wasn't a problem until... I outline what the scenarios are and so forth. And they said, oh yeah, we see this and this and this. And at the end, they came up and said, you know, I really feel good that my company is coming to us and asking us to be a part of this. That makes us feel good about our company. And I, you know, I shared this with some of the leadership of these banks and they were like surprised and they asked a lot of questions because, you know, it's really important for your client, your, your own employees to feel good about what you're doing. And, you know, as uh, organizations move into this ESG world and they address the environment and governance and the social side, which includes modern slavery and so forth. Employees are feeling good about the organizations they're working with. So there's this, it's not always about preventing something bad from happening. It's about feeling good about the fact that you're not only making money and you're growing and you're, you're, you're becoming a, a, a company that is, uh, is, is, uh, selling things and making things and doing things, but you're also making the world a better place. That's the world we need to live in. And so we do everything we can within the ESG and sustainability space, along with addressing these vulnerabilities to help companies to reach their full potential, to help them to have that moment of insight where they come to realize that they can make a profit and do good at the same time. And that's a good thing for not only for them, but for the world as well. Certainly with Generation Y and Generation Z, uh, certainly with the millennials and, and, and Generation Z, the Zoomers, Pride in one's employer matters a great deal, it seems, perhaps more so than to, you know, people of my cohort, Generation X. Uh, but yeah, they, they, they take ESG to heart, perhaps more than older generations do. And I think it's, it's going to reach a tipping point, you know, and enough of the old guard will pass on. And, you know, I think we'll be having a very different discussion about ESG in even 10, 12, 15 years from now, where it will, it will not get the askance looks, you know, the dirty looks, the skewed views that it, it's getting now, uh, because uh, again, it is, it is a generational shift and I, I think it matters more to generation, uh, to generation one, to ge generation Z, um, uh, and that, and that's, that's for the better. We've covered a lot of ground, but is there anything you feel we didn't cover in in our discussion that you'd like to um, share with our audience? Well, I mean, I'll just say that I I I have a couple of books out related to um, human trafficking. Where were you? Is one uh, Penguin Random House book. I have another one coming out, Awakening the Advocate, which focuses on helping people to understand how to get that advocate voice uh, in in their heart to to move beyond just thinking about things, the be the hero one. Also, just based on India, I my, my kids are half Indian. And um, so, I mean, I uh, have an affinity, affinity to that particular location and part of the world and so forth. I wrote a book called Dancing in the Light of the Moon, where I use fiction as a means of uh, educating and informing. I say that because you can't begin to think about what you can do to help to address this if you don't know what the problem is. And so what we're trying to do is just raise awareness. All the profits of these books go to uh, fighting modern slavery and so forth. And so uh, if there's interest, there's those books and other books as well. You know, go online, look at YouTube videos, read newspaper articles related to this, uh, documentaries or whatever it is that is required to raise awareness and then be part of the solution. And as they say, it's pretty easy. You can just share that information with other people. You can talk to your coworkers. You can volunteer. Actually, my youngest volunteer was nine years old. This girl saw me in a documentary and said, Mr. Friedman, I want to help. I said, you're nine years old. She said, so what? I said, you're nine years old. She said, nine-year-olds are the new 16-year-olds. Give me a chance. And so I had some things. I said to her, what is it that you can do? She said, I can find anything on the internet. So I gave her some things that I had given to some second year law 
school graduates that were working on, they couldn't find it within two days. She found it because for, for real. Yeah. Wow. Her inherent gift was that she could find things on the internet. We all have these gifts. Some it's public speaking, others it's writing or coordinating things or selling t-shirts. It doesn't matter. You apply what your gift is to volunteerism and it's a win-win. So the world, you know, it's in dire need of help. And to expect the governments and the NGOs and the United Nations to solve all these problems, none of the issues of our time even have 5% impact. We as individuals with the world, within the world have to step up, identify what our cause is, and find a way of being part of the solution. And that, to me, is a fundamental change that has to happen globally in order for us to really make a difference. Well, let it never be said that successive generations are not more tech savvy than those that came before. Matthew Friedman, you do good work. Please continue to do so. And thank you for coming on the show. Hope to have you back again soon. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us. Until next time.